actually because we're doing the first ever um, taping that's going to go onto a YouTube video, and right now it's um, Google Air. It was also we had a little bit of technical difficulty at the first, and I was so um, I liked that my technology guru Kathy Reed, who's here at the laptop, actually had to turn and say to someone else, "I need help." So, uh, if any of you ever feel like uh, you need help, just uh, there's nothing shameful in asking that. I call Kathy a lot for help. Um, Again, I want to welcome you for coming on such a beautiful day, unless you're avoiding taxes like some of us, um, or have some sort of reverse seasonal affective disorder where you don't like beautiful weather and sunny days. Um, there's only a few reasons that I can think of to bring all of you out here. And believe it or not, genealogy might not even be enough. But when we put that together with celebrating Irish heritage, and also with the stature of the speakers that we have today, I can see why we have such um, a good crowd. So again, thank you again. Our first presenter is Dave Schroeder, and I've known Dave since he was a librarian in the local history department at the Kenton County Public Library. He is now a much bigger shot than that. He <laughs> is the executive director of the Kenton County Public Library, and he was showing me on his phone pictures of what the new genealogy department is going to look like. And all I can say is that for genealogists, it's very good when a former genealogy librarian is at the top of an organization. It looks beautiful and fabulous. Um, Dave comes with I think excellent credentials because they're basically the same as mine, which is an MA from the University of Cincinnati and an MLS from the University of Kentucky. But he's also, in addition to that, um, an outstanding genealogist um, and a great librarian and a friend. So I'd like to introduce Dave Schrader. I will be doing tweets from the presentation, so I don't want you to see me and think I'm just being rude and ignoring the speakers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I like to run over. Sorry. Now it is. Well, is no. Is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're hearing. Okay, good. I like to roam, so I'm going to hold it in my hand here. Um, again, my name is Dave Schroeder. I'm glad to be here. Um, I've given many, many talks on Irish history and genealogy. Uh, how many of you have Irish roots? Raise your hand. You noticed I didn't. <laughs> I have none. Absolutely none. Uh, I was working, I worked for 10 years at uh, the, the library in Covington, and I, uh, for four years I worked as the archivist for Thomas More College and the Diocese of Covington. It was a, a shared position. And during that time, the head of the history department, I was a history major at Thomas More before that, asked me if I'd be willing to speak on Irish history to a group. They had a request, and so I said, sure, why not? And I've been hooked ever since. So I've been doing Irish research for about 16, 17 years, although I have no Irish ancestry. So that's kind of my story. But I find the Irish um, uh, story very compelling and very interesting and very different from my background. My background is 100% German, like probably uh, many, <laughs> just like many Cincinnatians and Northern Kentuckians. Uh, I've got all my family on all four, all four grandparents traced back, and I'm 100% German, which I think is a little boring. So I, um, I try to uh, look at other ethnic groups as I go along uh, for some inspiration. But I want to thank Pat and the uh, Hamilton County Historical and Genealogical Society for inviting me today and talk to you a little bit about Irish immigration. We're going to talk about um, basically two phases of Irish immigration. Everything's working. Uh, phase one is basically the um, 1600 to 1830, and it's basically Ulster, Scots, Irish, and phase two is famine. We're going to spend most of our time on, on the first stage. Um, and Scots, Irish, just before we go any further, um, you, you'll hear Scots, Irish, is which, what I'm using, and you'll hear Scotch, S C O T C H, Irish. Uh, they're interchangeable, however, many people do not, especially of this ancestry, don't like the term Scotch-Irish uh, because of its connotation with liquor. And so uh, you have to be careful on which term you use. I tend to use Scots-Irish just because uh, it's 
little bit uh, more PC, I guess. But we'll talk about both of these phases today. Um, one, before we get started, and as a librarian, I always have to bring a book. This is one of my favorite books on Irish genealogy, or Irish history. It's called Irish Americans, and it's by J.P. Dolan. And I, I guarantee you it's in this collection, in this building. Um, Dolan is one of the preeminent Irish historians um, and has done an enormous amount of work on uh, Irish uh, American history and genealogy. So I highly recommend his work. And there are, as a, again as a librarian, there are tons of books on the back, so I hope you all check those out before you leave and maybe take one downstairs and check it out uh, at the, before you leave the building. So we're going to start with 1600, and uh, Northern Ireland is basically a Gaelic stronghold, meaning that it's uh, solidly Irish. Um, there are, there's very little other uh, nationalities living in Northern Ireland. Um, the English government, however, uh, begins to take action to break that stronghold. Now we have to look at the English at this time period. They're doing uh, similar things that the Span Spanish were doing, the Portuguese. They're looking for uh, to expand their empire. They're looking to expand their influence. And Ireland was a natural place because it's right across the Irish Sea from England. And so Ireland uh, becomes a place of colonization, you might say, for the English. And oftentimes when uh, I give this talk, I have to always uh, remember to say that the English, sometimes the English come off badly. However, most European uh, nationalities of power were doing the same things in other parts of the world. And so um, we have to always keep that in mind. Um, but in 1610, the British began encouraging migration from Scotland, uh, to Scotland, uh, excuse me, from Scotland and England to Ulster. And I'll show you a map of Ulster in a minute. And Ulster is the northern counties of Ireland. So there's this uh, general move to encourage um, people from Scotland and England to move to Ulster. Uh, many of them are given land grants, and so the uh, property is confiscated from the native Irish and given mostly to English landlords. Uh, a few of the Scots were given uh, plantations, but mostly to the English landlords. Uh, prior to this time, there had been much movement between Scotland and Northern Ireland. And if you look on a map, they're very close. So you could take a small boat from one nation to the other without much difficulty. And so there's always been strong ties between Northern Ireland and Scotland, even before this time period. Here's the map. The purple area is Ulster. Um, these are the four major regions of Ireland, and then the counties are uh, the smaller geographical regions. Um, Ulster is, uh, again, the purple, and if right across the sea there you would see England, um, and so, again, the proximity made Ireland a very desirable place for the English to expand. The other thing that we're going to see throughout this presentation today is the role religion has played in the history of Ireland, both Protestant and Catholic, and how that has developed uh, throughout Irish history, and how it continues to have a role in uh, modern-day Ireland up until our time. So uh, Irish, uh, as we said, Irish land was confiscated from Catholics for the most part in Northern Ireland. Uh, plantations were given to mostly Anglicans. Uh, Anglicans are the Church of England. What are Anglicans in America? Episcopalians. Okay, so we, we know what we're talking about now. And to a lesser extent to the Scots. Between 1600 and 1640, about 100,000 Scots left northern Scotland and uh, moved across the channel into Ulster. Many of them were farmers, other were fishermen. Uh, many came with trades, uh, and we're going to see how that's different from the famine Irish. Many of these Ulster Irish developed trades. Uh, they were following the ancient uh, Scottish and English um, trade system, and so they were being taught um, specific trades, barrel making, um, coopering, smithing, those kinds of things. Um, this continued throughout the 17th century. So uh, throughout the 1600s, we're seeing this migration from Scotland to Northern, to Northern Ireland, and to a lesser extent from England to Northern Ireland. Uh, one thing that the um, uh, Scots brought with them was their faith. Uh, the English were Anglican. Uh, what were the Scots? Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Uh, John Calvin, 
uh, on the mainland, and John Knox in uh, Scotland uh, are the uh, major players in that movement. But for the most part, the Scots were strongly Presbyterian, and they brought that Presbyterian faith with them to Northern Ireland. So by the early 1700s, we have Catholicism, which is the native religion. We have uh, Anglicanism, and we have Presbyterianism. Uh, and this is not far after the Protestant Reformation. And so we're seeing a very hotbed of religious um, uh, rivalry going on in uh, Northern Ireland in particular. This is really the turning point in Ireland for, uh, for the Irish people. In 1690, there's the Battle of Boyne, which was between James II, who was uh, a Catholic. He was in the line for the throne of England. And William of Orange, who was Protestant. Uh, the nobles in England were very afraid of James II, that he was going to reinstitute the Catholic faith in, in England. And he had fled and actually went to France. Uh, and the, uh, the nobles had invited William and Mary of Orange, who are from where? Does anybody know where William and Mary of Orange are from? The Netherlands. The Netherlands. So the current British royal family are Dutch, not English. Uh, if you remember, their, what, what was their original name? Do you know? They were from the House of Hanover. They changed that to the House of Windsor during the war to make them sound less German. But they are of German ancestry. Um, the, the battle, uh, James uh, pulls together a, an army, mostly in Ireland. There is the Battle of Boyne fought in Ireland in 1690. William is victorious, and in 1691 a truce is signed. The result of this truce uh, has had impacts on Ireland to this day. Uh, it gave control of Ireland to England. So basically, Ireland ceased to exist as an independent nation, the, the whole of Ireland at this time. William of Orange consolidated his power, and uh, 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 Anglicanism becomes the state religion in, uh, in England, and we'll see what that uh, impact has on both Ireland and Scotland. But it basically makes the Protestant Anglican minority the rulers of Ireland for the next 200 years. So if you think about the IRA during our lifetimes, a lot of that uh, tension and a lot of that um, bigotry and hatred between the two groups is going back this far. This is a very long period of tension between two different groups. And the Catholics in Ireland still remember this battle um, negatively. And Protestants in Ireland celebrate this battle as their great victory. And so this battle is still very much a part of Irish culture. There's the two gentlemen, by the way. There's William of Orange. He is the, the Dutch. Uh, he is the uh, ancestor of the current British royal family. And there's James II, who was the, uh, the Catholic. Um, I can't imagine either of them in battle. Can you? <laughs> They look a little bit like two dandies, <laughs> but uh, they, uh, their battle really sealed the fate of what was going on in Ireland during that time period. 1715, the population of Ulster is 600,000. By that time, a half were Catholic, about a half were Presbyterian, Church of Ireland, Anglican, and other Protestants. What's the Church of Ireland? Anybody know? Yes. That's the uh, church that during the Protestant revolt uh, was run by Henry VIII, and, and they just made it the Church of Ireland. Correct. It's basically the Anglican Church in Ireland. So if you're thinking of uh, the the church, uh, the Anglican Church in England, the Church of Ireland follows very similar theology. It's it's basically the Anglican Church in Ireland. And so you have, again, we're having this, uh, this toxic brew of religion in, in Ireland uh, during a time period right after, the right after the Reformation, and so uh, lots of tension. You've seen the ha that the Catholic majority in Ulster has lost half of their land. What happened to many of those Catholics? If you lost your land, what would you do during this time period? Went south. Someone south. Yes. Well, the facts show that almost all of them stayed in Ireland. 
Correct. Because there was no trade in, in taking anybody anywhere else at that time. Correct. And many ended up just staying in Northern Ireland and working on their former property, which again is rubbing salt in the wounds when you think about it. The English gave preferential treatment to members of the Church of Ireland in Ireland. Uh, penal laws were established to encourage conversion. We think When we think of the penal laws, we usually think of penal laws against Catholics, but the original penal laws were not only against Catholic, they were also against uh, any other religious minority. So anyone who was not Anglican or Church of Ireland. So um, Presbyterians were included in those laws. And so uh, one of the major portions of those laws, uh, the Sacramental Act of 704, said that every government official or member of the military had to be a practicing member of the Church of Ireland or Anglican. So basically it barred Catholics, it barred Presbyterians, it barred any Protestant minority from being, holding government office or holding a military rank. Um, later on, it uh, closed most uh, many Presbyterian churches and actually closed uh, most of the Presbyterian schools that had been established by the denomination. So these were pretty harsh um, laws uh, and in time kept many, uh, even though it was not the law, kept many, um, many of the uh, Presbyterians out of the professions. Uh, admittance into college, for instance, for medical school, for law school, um, what, it was very uh, difficult for a Presbyterian to be, uh, to be admitted into those professional schools. And so there is this undercurrent of bigotry going on, not only against Catholics, which we, which we know about, but also Presbyterians, which I think many people, um, it's been kind of forgotten, and uh, we need to remember that aspect as well. Uh, the Church of England and Ireland dominated government in England. Many Protestant churches and schools were closed. Uh, this brought about a great distrust for government amongst these Presbyterians, these Scots-Irish. And we'll talk about how that translates when they get to this country. Um, many fled to North America. First of all, there was religious freedom for Protestants in North America. And when we, whenever we talk about immigration, we talk about the push of immigration and the pull of immigration. There's always something that's pushing people out of where they live. And wherever they're going, is that there's something pulling them. So in the 1700s, the push for um, Presbyterians leaving Ireland was religious persecution. Also during the 1700s, there was a period of famine. And there was a, an economic collapse in England. So there was an economic reason, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, there was also in North America. Uh, little interference from government during this time period. It was, there was much more freedom and less government influence in the North American colonies than there was in Ireland or England. So those are the pushes of immigration for these Irish. This is land ownership in Ireland. It's the first map is 1641, the second map is 1703. The darker the color, the higher Catholic ownership. So you'll see in 1641 how much of the how much of Ireland was owned by Catholics. You'll see by 1703, 60 years <laughs> later, how much was owned by Catholics. A dramatic, dramatic drop. Most of the land was either confiscated or because of high prices and the inability to support families had to be sold off. And so we're seeing that Ireland, even though the great majority of people are continued to be Catholic, uh, most of the uh, land by 1700 is owned by the Protestant minority. And most of those are Anglican uh, landlords who had been given or deeded those properties by the royal crown. The economy in the 1700s in Ireland. Again, we talked about the push and pull. One of the pushes between 1718 and 1729, there was a famine in Ulster. 480,000 people died of starvation or sickness. Uh, it's a huge portion of the population. Um, and certainly um, during that time period, people are looking for other alternatives. Uh, because the economy was shrinking due to 
the famine, uh, rents were being raised. Uh, many of the many of the plantations were owned by absentee landlords. So uh, if you think about it, the, the the owner was in England and he had a caretaker on the property in Ireland. And so the absentee landlord landlords basically were raising the rents, and so many people could no longer afford to pay their rents. Uh, and so America again seemed to be the best option. So the pushes were economy and religion, uh, religious discrimination. The attraction we talked about was religious freedom in America, less government interference. What else is a, a pool? What else is going on in America in the 1700s that would maybe be attractive to these individuals? Yeah, you have land. Land was readily available. What about language? Common language. Common language. If you're going to leave some place that speaks English, it's much easier to go someplace else where they speak English. Uh, and so uh, North America was a, uh, an interesting and uh, reasonable uh, solution. <coughs> Most of these folks settled in the middle colonies. So if you think of uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, um, even parts of uh, Virginia, um, and it's interesting that uh, many came as indentured servants, so that's how they paid their way to get here. Uh, an American landowner would uh, agree to pay for their transportation in exchange for their work when they got to the United States. So their contract would read that once they got to the United States, they would work for this owner for, actually it was not, he was a landowner, for a X amount of years and then he would uh, gain his freedom. And so it was a way of financing one's trip, especially if, if they did not have the funds to do so on their own. Uh, others traveled in family units. And if you look at these first Scots-Irish immigrants that we're talking about and compare them to the famine Irish, there's a much higher degree of family immigration amongst the Scots-Irish. So they came much more in family groups than the famine Irish did. Uh, many of them, again, we talked about the mistrusted government. Uh, they had seen English oppression, uh, and so many of them um, immediately moved to the frontier. Why was the frontier attractive to them? Well, it was one place they could go. I, 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 not to quote uh, Kipling, who came much later in the game, but it was always said that the Scottish were in the fore of every battle of the British Empire, mm -hmm. and they have given the if the Appalachian Hills were rougher than the Nice Plains, then that's where they were. So yeah. it was a natural place for them to be. Correct. Uh, and if you think about it, the, the Appalachian region is, uh, if you think of Scotland and Northern Ireland, very rocky, very craggy, um, this was a land that they were familiar with. Uh, what else is going on in the frontier government? If you think of government on the frontier in America, why would this be attractive to them? What kind of government was going on on the frontier? Not much. Very little. <laughs> and so this again was very attractive to them. There was very little government interference. Uh, and if you think about Appalachia today, you know, the, the opposition to government. Uh, that's a long-standing tradition among Scots-Irish. Um, the revenue agent. <laughs> you know, we hear those stories about the, you know, the opposition against the revenue agents. Taxes, all of those things uh, that we see in Appalachia today, uh, many of them can be traced back to this very independent streak of these early Scots-Irish immigrants. Uh, bluegrass music. Have you ever have you ever listened to bluegrass music and then listened to Irish music? Um, there are direct parallels. There are many uh, music uh, people in the PhD programs who have done their dissertations on that connection between Irish music and Appalachian music. Um, there, the parallels are um, very strong. Um, again, the tradition of independence, suspicion of government. Uh, these, as, as you had pointed out, many of the Scots-Irish were amongst the earliest supporters of the American Revolution. They wanted to th overthrow the British. They wanted to remove that tyranny that they had experienced, not only in Ulster, but also uh, in America. 
And so some of the earliest volunteers for the American Revolution were Scots-Irish. And some of the, most, uh, the earliest presidents uh, have Scots-Irish ancestry. And I think um, last time I looked, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 35 presidents that had some Scots-Irish ancestry. Uh, the number is enormous. Um, and so these, these uh, gentlemen and women and their families had a great impact, not only on the middle colonies, but also on the frontier. And they did not stop at the Appalachians. I'll show you a map in a minute, and you'll see where many of the Scots-Irish ended up. Uh, the Whiskey Rebellion was another uh, thing that uh, George Washington had to deal with in his uh, term as first president, and that the, um, many of those living in Appalachia were growing what? What kind of grain? Corn. corn. And it was, it was very <coughs> difficult to transport corn to the eastern seaboard before the canals and railroads. It was cheaper to do so by doing what? Made it into moonshine and sent it that way. Uh, it was a much smaller uh, amount to transport, and so uh, they were making whiskey, sending it east. Uh, they were being taxed, and this was again against their nature. They saw this as oppression. And uh, one of Washington's earliest decisions he had to make against his own people was to put down that rebellion. But if you look to see who was involved with the Whiskey Rebellion, you will find many of those independent-minded Scots-Irish uh, leading the charge. In America, uh, you can usually figure out when a Scots-Irish community arrives in America when you see the first Presbyterian congregation formed. Uh, in, in Cincinnati, it's in the early 1800s. Uh, and I cannot remember what church that is. Is that a Garfield Place? Anybody? That's the old St. Paul's, I think. Uh, Second Presbyterian oh, Church, sorry. Elm Street. Yeah. Look at that uh, from uh, the park down. Yes, yeah. you're correct. So uh, looking in, uh, in the colonies, look for Presbyterian churches to be formed. Uh, on the frontier, if you're looking for um, uh, Evidence of Presbyterians being on the frontier, the Great Awakening, and the Second Great Awakening. The Presbyterians were very involved in that movement, uh, converting uh, Anglicans um, to uh, the, the more evangelical forms of faith or uh, less Anglican forms of faith. And so we're seeing um, the Presbyterians involved in the Great Awakening movements as well. Uh, interestingly, with the Irish, the, this first wave of Irish, the Scots-Irish, they settled in both rural and urban areas. Most were Presbyterian and it remained Presbyterian for at least two generations. So um, they um, stuck to that faith. And if you look at uh, immigrants in general, think about what immigrants hold on to the longest. They get rid of their dress pretty quickly. Food, um, slowly kind of, you know, they keep certain recipes, but for the most part, they're eating what's available locally. Um, language, usually the second generation is learning English because they want to make money. <laughs> and that is still true with immigrants today in most places in this country. Religion tends to be the thing that lasts the longest. And so uh, if you have uh, ancestors who are Presbyterian, um, there's a high likelihood that you have Scots-Irish ancestry, or somewhere in that line there's Scots-Irish ancestry. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, in, in the 1839 uh, Covington uh, City Directory, they listed, it was the only time in the City Directory they listed people by nationality. Every person in the directory is listed by where they came from. Um, I wish they would have done that for the next 50 years, but they didn't. <laughs> Uh, but in 1839, there's 35 heads of household uh, in Covington listed as Irish. They're not listed as Scots-Irish. They refer to themselves as Irish. When do they start referring to themselves as Scots-Irish? Anybody know? Post-famine. When the famine immigrants came, uh, they were Catholic. <laughs> they were poor. They usually lived in slums because of their poverty. And so that's when these early Irish started referring to themselves as Scots-Irish. So 
So when you're looking prior to the 1850s in, a, in the census and you're looking to see a nationality, or if you're looking at nationality of anyone during that time period, those Scots-Irish refer to themselves as Irish, period. They had lived in Ireland usually for a couple of uh, centuries or at least two or three generations, and so they refer and, and identify themselves as Irish when they came here. And so when the census taker asked them where they came from, Ireland. Later on, you start seeing the word Scots-Irish turn up. Uh, and that's when the famish Irish came. And they were, they were differentiating themselves from this new group of poor Irish coming in in very large numbers. The darker the state, the higher the percentage of Scots-Irish. So you'll see those middle states, West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee. Maine, for, I think it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a little anomaly. But look further west. They moved all the way to the western seaboard. So we're looking at Montana, uh, Wyoming, um, uh, Washington State, Oregon. Uh, and so the movement um, across the country was uh, pretty swift. Uh, Alabama is also a, uh, an interesting one, I think. But again, a quite a, uh, a, a good um, dispersal throughout the United States. Now we have our second wave of immigrants. We said by 1775, Native Irish Catholics owned 5% of Ireland. Now, can you imagine within basically uh, 100 years, they had gone from owning most of their nation to owning 5%. So they had gone from being landowners to being uh, renters, to be working for other people, land, uh, landlords, many times absentee landlords. Uh, sharecropping, if you can think of in the American South, a similar version of sharecropping going on in um, Famine Ireland. Some of the rules that were developed by the English uh, uh, also uh, made this land ownership shift possible. Uh, when an Irish Catholic man died, his estate had to be divided among all his sons. In Germany, for instance, the eldest son received all the property. It kept the family property intact. In Ireland, the new law was that the property had to be divided by all the sons. So if you had five sons, your 50 acres became 10, 10, 10, 10, and 10. The next generation of each one of those had five sons. And so you see what's happening with land ownership. And it got to the point where you could no longer make a living off such a small plot of land and then they would end up selling it or it would be seized because they couldn't pay their rents or their taxes. Uh, interestingly enough, another law, this is part of those penal laws we talked about, uh, if one child converted to, to Protestantism, uh, he received the entire estate. Interestingly enough, the, the research that I have done indicates that there are very, very few Catholic men who took that option. Um, much of it was due to pride. Uh, some of it was due to um, how would you be perceived by your neighbors <laughs> if you took that move? You would become a social pariah basically in your own community. And so um, those laws, um, again, were uh, very oppressive. Potatoes were the main, main source of food in Ireland, again, due to that land size. The, the typical Irish person uh, family was being supported on 1.5 acres of property, and that was enough to plant potatoes and feed the family for the year. So 1.5 acres could feed a family with potatoes. There were very few other crops that could be planted on that small of acreage and support a large family. And so potatoes became the major crop in Ireland. Uh, the blight actually occurs in continental Europe first. So my family's from northwest Germany along the Dutch border. They uh, experienced the potato blight 50 years before the Irish. 
The difference in Germany was they were growing potatoes, they were growing wheat, they were growing barley, and so there were other things to fall back on because the property was large enough that the family could diversify their crops. In Ireland, that was not the case. So when the potato crop failed, their sole source or one of their sole sources of food was gone. It is a fungus, and so it will turn the potato black. Uh, and in the 1840s, the first case is found, and they went to get the potatoes to plant for the new year, and they're black. Uh, and panic ensues. Where do we get potatoes? Potatoes. From potatoes. So if the potato dies, where are we going to get our next year's crop of potato? It's a big problem. Uh, it spreads very quickly from continental Europe throughout uh, uh, and into Ireland. Uh, began in Ireland in 1846. So the first case of the, of, of the blight began in 1846. Now, uh, traditionally this era, time period was called uh, the Great Famine or the, fa the Potato Famine. Uh, more recently, uh, it's being referred to uh, as the Great Hunger. And so if you, if you hear the term the Great Hunger, they're talking about the same time period. So it's two interchangeable terms for the same thing. Most Americans are still familiar with the term um, the famine, so I, we continue to use famine. The English response, though, was laissez-faire. Who's a French major? How does that translate? Let it be. Basically, let it be. So their idea was not to get, you don't get involved in the economy. Let the economy alone and it will regenerate itself. It will work itself out. Uh, things will work out. You just need to stay, stay out of the, the private industry, stay out of what's going on in the economy and let it work itself out. Um, that really um, did not work. Mostly because the potatoes continued to fail. And so no matter how much you wanted the economy to bounce back, if there was no food source, um, there was no chance of that occurring. This is a picture, and I love this picture. It's a woman sitting on her property. See the little dark figure in the middle of the picture? She is the matriarch of this Irish family. Her property is sitting around her. Uh, the family had a photographer come and take a picture of her right before they were evicted. So this woman and her family are being evicted uh, a few minutes after this photograph was taken. So it's, a, it's, it's an image that kind of tells a story um, that I can't tell uh, effectively as this image can. Uh, there are um, stories in Western Ireland that was hit uh, 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 very hard by the famine where families actually boarded up the walls and um, boarded up the doors and windows in their homes and locked themselves and their families inside to starve. There was nothing to eat. Um, the options were very limited beyond that. You know, in, in times of distress, in, in our communities, we would go to family. In Ireland, the family, you know, everybody in the family was suffering in the same way, so there was no family to go to because they were in the same boat you were. The English did set up workhouses. Um, the Irish absolutely detested them. Uh, as soon as you entered a workhouse, you were divided by gender and by age. So the children were sent off into a dormitory where they were taught to be good English citizens. The wives were sent off to do manual labor in one part of the building, and the husbands were sent off into another area to do work to support themselves in another part of the building. And so the family was divided uh, as soon as they entered the workhouse. The, condi the conditions were miserable. Um, it was degrading to the Irish to be put in that position. And many chose to starve to death before they would enter a workhouse. There were at, uh, several dozen of them established over time. And um, um, they were really not effective in really meeting the needs of all those immigrants. Uh, or all of those who were who were suffering, and again, thousands, really hundreds of thousands, by the end were evicted. 
Between 1845 and 1851, the population of Ireland increased by 2 million, and this number is very fluid. I've seen as high as 3, I've seen as low as 1.8 million. Um, 2 seems to be the one that most uh, historians agree upon. About a million of those starved by disease, or, or starved to death, or were weakened so badly that they uh, died of some sort of contagious disease and about a million left. Most came to the United States, others went to England, Canada, Australia. You'll see where they were going to again, they were going to places within the British realm or what had been the British realm and where English was spoken. Why did these famine immigrants not leave during the first famine where the Ulster uh, Scots-Irish left? We talk about the push and the pull. What was the one thing that pushed them out, pushed the Presbyterians out of Northern Ireland, out of Ulster? Well, they were they were just a traveling people anyway. They were. I mean, they, they weren't. They they never they still haven't settled. Here. Correct. So. so they had that tradition. The other thing was religion. Remember, we talked about there was freedom of religion for the most part for Protestants. For Catholics during the 1700s. Um, Religious freedom was still not something accepted in the New World for the most part. Uh, by this time, though, in the 1840s, 1850s, um, we had rules, we had laws, we had the Second Amendment um, that protected religious freedom to a certain extent in this country. And so America becomes a much more desirable, desirable place to go. Also, what's going on in America, the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, economically? Factories, jobs. The Industrial Revolution, if you can think of the Industrial Revolution. There are an enormous amount of jobs available in this country. There's railroads being built. The canals are being built. Um, there's just a, a, an enormous amount of opportunity in this country that they did not have in Ireland. Now, we talked about the Scots-Irish coming in family groups predominantly. The famine Irish... Uh, really came up with a, a plan that other uh, immigrants followed and it's called chain migration. Uh, the Irish, um, in particular the famine Irish, uh, usually did not have enough money to send the entire family at once. Um, and so they would send one person uh, at a time or several people at a time. So you're an Irish family in Ireland during the famine. You're, you've decided you're going to uh, America. Which member of the family are you going to send? Second oldest son. <laughs> Second oldest son. What else? Daughter. What, a daughter. Any other ideas? <coughs> the husband. Husband. Before we get to that point. I, f I forgot this one. This is the, the drop in population. <coughs> so the darker colors, the darkest color is 30% drop in population during the famine years. The lightest color, uh, this is the yellow, is up to 10%. So you see enormous losses. If you think about it, uh, there was about 6 million population in uh, Ireland before the famine. 2 million gone. Uh, half of those died the other half left. So if we would count off in this room, one third of us would be gone. Uh, that gives you kind of an idea on what impact this had on Ireland. Chain migration. They sent the oldest daughter, typically. One thing that was in great need in uh, America were house servants. You had a growing middle class. Middle class women needed help in the household, raising children doing housework. Um, you can imagine how difficult it was to keep up a house without all the modern conveniences that we have today, and it's bad enough today. <laughs> uh, you can imagine doing everything um, without electricity, for instance. And so there's, there's this great need in America and a great desire for domestics. And you'll see many Irish families sent the oldest daughter first. Hmm. Now imagine you're in famine Ireland, you have an 18, 17 year old daughter, you put her on a sailing ship and you send her away across the ocean. How difficult a choice that must have been. Um, 
The same thing for those early Scots-Irish, and they were coming as families, at least, though, for the most part. The, these families were sending off typically one person at a time, or maybe two daughters at a time. Very tough decision to make. Uh, the one benefit of having a daughter in domestic service in America, uh, the pay was not great, but what did they get along with the pay? Room and board. So usually their salary was theirs. And during this time period, there are millions of dollars literally leaving America back to Ireland, not only to support and keep the families alive, but also for them to put money aside to send more of the family over. And so this chain migration um, was something that the famine Irish um, somewhat pioneered. And you'll see other um, immigrant groups kind of follow the practice um, as time goes on. This is the tip of Manhattan. The Ulster Irish and the Famine Irish, when they came to Manhattan, for instance, uh, say they landed in Manhattan, where were they going through immigration? Castle Garden. Yes. Well, actually, the Ulster Irish were probably not even going through. They weren't going through Castle Garden. They were going through nothing. Right. <laughs> the distinction we make today between legal and illegal immigration <laughs> does not exist during this time period. It really does not come about until the 1920s in any great um, sense of the word. And so the, the definition between legal and illegal is a fairly modern concept in America. And again, I think when we have these debates about immigration, we tend to forget. People say, well, my people came here legally. Well, my people came in the 1840s. If they could get here and they didn't have a disease, they were legal. Uh, you know, there were there were no quotas. There was there was none of that kind of green card. None of that process was in place during this time period. Uh, the little um, circular building at the tip of Manhattan is Castle Garden. So many of the famine Irish who came um, to New York would have gone through Castle Garden. Uh, anybody know what year um, Ellis Island opened? 1892. Yes. So uh, again, a relatively new phenomenon for us. Castle Garden was um, uh, the predecessor, you might say, of Ellis Island. And many of those Ulster Irish would have landed in uh, Pennsylvania. They would have uh, landed in Philadelphia, for instance, or in Baltimore, uh, not in the north. The Famine Irish, many of them came into Boston. Many of them came into New York. Uh, Many of them filtered into the rest of the country, uh, but many also stayed on that eastern seaboard. And so uh, some of that was due to their inability to purchase land. They did not have the money to purchase land or to travel any further. Once they got here, they got here. And so they stayed where they landed. Uh, most of the famine Irish, we said that the, many of the Ulster Irish had skills. They had gone through the trade apprenticeship programs. Most of the famine Irish were subsistence farmers in Ireland. Uh, when they came to the United States, it's very interesting. If you look where they settle, they settle in the wards in Cincinnati along the Ohio River and in northern Kentucky along the Ohio and Licking Rivers. Why would they have settled in those areas? Yes. No one told them that that area flooded. Yes. <laughs> it flooded every year or multiple times during the year. And so rent was very cheap along the river. And so uh, you could actually get a reason, reasonable housing for, um, for these folks along the Ohio River in the Licking Rivers. And even if your house flooded, you still at least were not in Ireland starving. Uh, by 1850, there's 13,616 native-born Irish in Cincinnati. Most at this time period were those early famine Irish immigrants. Railroads were a big um, source of employment for uh, Irish immigrants from both periods, actually, uh, for the Scots-Irish later, but uh, mainly for the um, uh, famine Irish. This is the railroad yards in Ludlow, which is my hometown, but um, this is a southern railroad, which uh, is a very interesting history all on its own, in that the southern is owned by who? Who owns the southern railroad? 
city the city of Cincinnati. Cincinnati. It's one of the few municipally owned railroads in the country uh, that uh, actually came through Ludlow. Covington and Ludlow had a major battle as to who was going to get the railroad through the town. And the Ludlow family donated the property free uh, for 100 years. And so Ludlow won out. The old stereotype, one of my professors at UC uh, was one of the, Roger Daniels, he was one of the preeminent immigration historians in the country, um, talked about the um, immigrant stereotypes and um, usually started out every immigration class talking about certain stereotypes. But one of those for the Irish is that so many of them became cops and policemen. But he said that the stereotypes usually had some kernel of truth. <laughs> And in this case, they did. Uh, if this is the Newport Police Department in the 1890s, 1880s, and uh, about two thirds of those folks were Irish or Irish ancestry. Again, it was an easy, uh, it was a job that they could get without having a formal education. Um, the Irish, uh, both the Scots Irish and the Ulster, or the Famine Irish, um, figured out the political system in the U United States uh, very quickly and found ways to um, make their way in this country and knew that their vote had power because they had not had the vote uh, in England or in Ireland. And so uh, the vote became very important and they used their vote very effectively. <laughs> Sometimes legally and sometimes not. <laughs> but uh, they uh, used the political system in this country, and many of them became civil servants and were able to move up the ladder very quickly for that reason. This is going to be the last. Well, I've got one more after this. But um, major institution in the, in the Ulster Irish were Presbyterian, the Presbyterian Church. In the Famine Irish, it was the Catholic Church. And so you'll see that by 1850, the Catholic Church was the largest the, the largest denomination in the United States, mostly due to those large numbers of famine immigrants already arriving. 60% of all bishops were Irish born in 1860. Why? Why Irish Why did the Irish bishops move up the ladder so quickly in the hierarchy of the Catholic Church? They had one advantage over the Germans, over the Italians, over the language. Poles. Language. They spoke English. They were native English speakers. 1851, Cincinnati had 11 parishes, five were English speaking. In this part of the United States, English speaking is synonymous for Irish. <laughs> and so if you look in most neighborhoods, you will see uh, at least two congregations, one Irish, one German. In other parts of the country, you might see as many as five within a two or three block area because there's a church for the Poles, the Irish, the Germans, the Lithuanians, etc. Uh, we did not, in this area, have as many of those later immigrants. Um, the Irish and the Germans were our last major waves of immigration. That's, uh, I just drove by that this morning, actually. That's uh, St. Francis Xavier on Sycamore. Uh, this is St. Peter and Change, which was established as an English-speaking congregation. But it was the first German-speaking congregation. Holy, Holy Trinity. Trinity. What happened to the old Irish neighborhoods? <laughs> Remember what I told you, many of them lived along the Ohio River and the Licking River. What's along the Ohio and Licking River now? Stadiums, malls. Not many houses are there. <laughs> so many of those old institutions, the, the centers of Irish life, we have lost. I think what's interesting recently, though, is we're seeing a growth in um, interest in Irish culture. Uh, you're seeing a new Hibernian groups popping up. Um, the Fenians are popping up and uh, reestablishing themselves. Uh, I know in Covington they're talking about building a famine. They're raising money right now to build a fan, famine monument in Davout Park. And so there's this new uh, interest in Irish history in our region that I have not seen before. Uh, we have been so dominated by a German culture that we tend to forget that there are other cultures that uh, were mixing in. And although they were much smaller in proportion, they still had a great impact on us as a community. Yes? Dave, if you could just hold this picture. Yes. Now, I'm trying to get my hair. Okay, there's the Licking River. Yes. Now, if you look up to the uh, top north uh, 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 right 
section. It's hard to see here on Fifth Street. The parish that started there, it was an Irish parish in 1850 by Father Guilfoyle, was known throughout the Irish world. And back on conception in Newport. It was it was it was famous. People in Ireland knew about it, and, and they they had a, some kind of savings and loan where they got people loans to build houses. And then if you go over where the uh, and you know you should know this much better than anybody working at the Archdiocese down there, where the old St. Pat's was yes. in Covington. Correct. It is gone. Yeah, Nancy goes with it too. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Immaculate Conception in Newport, uh, Father Guilfoyle decided that he felt that every Irish family should own their own home. And so using parish money, he bought large chunks of property in Newport and subdivided it and sold it. And it was working very well until the Depression and the housing collapse of the 1870s. And basically the parish went bankrupt. And all of those loans were unsecured. Uh, it took 15 years for the U.S. Supreme Court to finally rule on, uh, on the property ownership of those properties. Father Guilfoyle was put into quick retirement. <laughs> Um, but the congregation was actually saved by two Irish distillers, the Walsh and the O'Shaughnessy families, who owned whiskey distilleries in northern Kentucky. And they actually bought the church at the courthouse door. They auctioned everything off, the bell, the school, everything one item by a time. And those two men went down to the courthouse in Newport and bought each one of those items back with their own funds. Okay, that's really the end of my talks, but I wanted to leave a little, a uh, few minutes for questions, so uh, hit me with them. Yes. Um, I Irish live along the Ohio River on the Cincinnati side, but they moved almost yes. a lot, yes. but it was always along the river. Yes. If you think of moving, moving for immigrants, and uh, it's a common amongst many immigrant groups, is what are they always chasing? Jobs jobs. Uh, during this time period, um, walking neighborhoods usually lived close to where you worked. What else were they chasing? Low rent <laughs> and a better house. So if you could move to a, a few blocks over, get a better house for less rent, all the better for you. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of those immigrants moving. My the Schroeder side of my family came to over the Rhine originally and then moved to Covington for the same reason. Um, they could get a bigger home and, and get out of more crowded situation in Cincinnati by moving across the river. Um, so you'll see immigrant groups um, throughout the country, but certainly in greater Cincinnati doing that frequently. And if you look at the city directories, that's what's great about the city directories. They tell you where these people are at any given point in time. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I have a family line. This is my my mother's maternal line. Yes. That went back to Ireland in 1649-ish. The Harlan family came over, um, and they settled with William Penn. Ah. They were Quakers. Interesting. But I don't know how to go farther than that <laughs> to figure hmm. out where they would go. That's a tough one. Lee Ann. I think they came from England. Yes. To Ireland. Lee Ann, probably, she's going to be the next speaker, is going to talk a little bit more about the genealogy aspect. She might be able to give you more information. My guess is the Quakers kept excellent records. It's finding the Quaker records that you need. Um, I think they were there, though, kind of right at the beginning of that movement. Okay. So, <coughs> yeah, yeah. go farther than that. Uh, I, I would think that the Quaker records would be helpful. Um, one good thing about having um, Catholic roots are, uh, we are so anal, and I say we because I am one of them, uh, we keep excellent records. And uh, Quakers did the same. Um, Quakers are certain denominations that keep very, very good records. And we often forget the church records predate, in most cases, civil records. <laughs> And so if you've, if you've run out of your luck with civil records, go to church records if you can get them. Um, some are more available than others. And uh, everybody who's laughing in this room knows why. I happen to be on the winning side of that process. Yes. 
out of sheer luck. Uh, in northern Kentucky, the Catholic Church records were allowed to be microfilmed up to 1925. So we have all the Diocese of Covington records microfilmed through 1925. The Archdiocese did not give that permission, and so you have to go through the Archdiocese. If you want Northern Kentucky Catholic Church records, we have them all on microfilm at the Kenton County Library. So it's just, it, it was the, the, the decision was given to the local bishops, and many decided to do so, many decided not. Actually, more decided not to than did. We were lucky that we had a bishop in Northern Kentucky at that time period that um, liked genealogy. He was Irish, by the way, uh, <laughs> and uh, saw no problems with it as long as we stuck within the 100 year time limit that the US government was using for the census. So that's what we did. Any other questions? Yes. You mentioned in the late 1600, early 1700s, um, the confiscation of property. Yes. Are there any surviving records from like the British archives or something? There are. There are actually uh, records in the British archives and uh, in the Irish archives um, that um, document that confiscation very well. The English were actually very good record keepers as well. And so um, those records do exist. The land records are uh, intact. And um, they are slowly, actually, a few of them I've seen online. So uh, if you go to the, um, the National Library of Ireland, the National Library of England, and um, try to um, look through, filter through their website and see if you can find any of those online. Uh, but they are intact. Thank you. Yes? Um, I know that a lot of the um, famine Irish immigrated through the seaports of the south. What yes. About the Ulster Irish, where did they leave from? Where did they come into the country? No, what ports did they leave? Oh, did they leave? Yeah. Most of them um, left from Northern Ireland um, directly, so the major ports of Northern Ireland, although some went um, down to Liverpool, uh, actually went into England and transferred from there. Many of the famine Irish, too, had a waylay. They didn't come directly from Ireland um, to. Um, to the United States, they went into England first, which seems like an odd move. <laughs> but if you had limited resources, you went to the nearest look. You know, you went to the nearest place that you could get out of that situation. And many of those Ulster immigrants did the same thing. They went back to Scotland or back to England, uh, then raised enough money, and then came to America. So you'll see a double move <laughs> instead of a single move. Any other questions? Well, I think we have some refreshments. Thanks so much, David. That was fantastic. Um, I think it was such a great, clear overview of the period. And for me, it was really a treat because I have the Ulster Irish oh, yes. immigrants, which often don't get talked yes, about. Correct. Um, Dave mentioned um, Irish Americans. It's also one of my favorite books, too. And I got one off the shelf. There are nine more available in the system, but only one on the shelf here. Um, but you can put a hold on it, but I'll put this on um, the table at the back if any of you are interested in checking that out. We do have some refreshments, and Leanne's going to need a few minutes to set up as well. So we're going to take about a 15 minute break. Um, so if you want to plan on being back in your seats around 10 till, we'll see you then. Thanks. Oh. Again, I just want to thank you all for being here. I know it's a beautiful day and there's many options. So uh, you're obviously very interested in your local history and your genealogy. So thanks for coming out and I appreciate you being here and uh, hope to see you here. And I'm sure uh, Pat hopes to see you here doing some research in the very near future. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.